hello, my name is Sarah Jane Parsons and I'm the director of the art galleries at TCU. I'm delighted to be here at KTCU today and joined by six contemporary artists that we've been working and collaborating with. Uh, our project today that we'll be discussing is an exhibition called Beyond Nature, which features the work of 16 contemporary artists that are responding to the Arctic landscape and their experiences of traveling and studying and collaborating uh, during an expedition to the Arctic Circle. Um, as I say, I'm joined today by six artists. The first that I'll introduce you to is Adam Fung, who is a TCU professor of art, who's a painter. And it was really through um, Adam's inspiration and energy that we're here today that he has organized and curated this exhibition, brought all the artists together in their artwork, and uh, really provided an amazing uh, lineup of artist talks that our students have been engaged in um, and excited to participate in. And Adam, I'd like to introduce you and thank you for this very beautiful exhibition that's been featured at Maudie Gallery. Um, and also ask you, uh, tell us a little bit about what brought you to this point, what, <laughs> what brought you to, um, to organizing the exhibition, but also how we're sitting here today with these five other wonderful artists. Thanks, Sarah Jane. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Adam Fung. I teach uh, painting in the School of Art at TCU. And I had a fantastic opportunity to, to participate in the Arctic Circle uh, residency, which is hosted on a sailing ship and sails around uh, the archipelago of Svalbard in June 2016. Um, when I got back from the trip, and even before I went on the residency, I, I had the inkling that it would be great to um, try to recreate that experience or, or explain that experience to another audience. Um, so uh, I, I created this sketch of a show idea in, in the late summer of 2016 and, and into the fall, um, was able to uh, find this, the gallery space, make the proposal and, and move forward with it. And ultimately, when I'm thinking about and when I'm explaining the, the show Beyond Nature, um, the way I approached it was to first to try to, to recreate that sense of expedition or an expedition of artists. And um, the second thing I wanted to do was show a wide range of responses and articulate that with a wide range of mediums. Um, and then lastly, thematically, being and trying to explain this experience being immersed in a landscape, um, being immersed in nature, and really going beyond this this idea of man versus nature, but and that's where the, the title grew out of. Okay, great. Yeah. And Adam, could you um, introduce us to our guests here today, just very briefly? Um, so with us today, we have a printmaker, Kate Collier, um, a photographer from Canada, Julie Forges. Did I do that right? Fog. Fog. <laughs> She'll say her name better um, <laughs> than I can do it. Uh, GP Le Bordes, um, Annie Awaskio, and Greg Locke. And I'll go back and they'll introduce themselves as well. Um, but again, a wide range of artists from, from all over the country we, and also from Canada. That's probably um, one of the interesting aspects of the exhibition is such a wide range of works. And I can only imagine when you're traveling on an expedition of this nature that you're in close quarters, you probably can't take many materials with you, that you really, this is kind of bare bones studio art making, um, probably a lot of photography involved, <laughs> aid de memoir, um, sketchbooks, those kinds of things. So you're really... Um, I'm imagining it's quite a challenge to be not only thinking about, but making art when you're um, in this kind of environment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think our expedition guide um, and leader, Sarah Gerats, um, did a great job of laying the groundwork for this, this relationship that we would have on the ship and amongst each other. And I think, you know, for the most part, everyone was really respectful of that relationship, um, whether it meant being completely silent while someone recorded sound. Um, and I, I'll, we can go around and maybe hear from everybody about that experience, your own experience with that. But I, you know, I had uh, I had brought a drone with me to to shoot the film I created, 
and that certainly was a point of contention and, and, and a, a learning experience for everybody, including myself. Um, I, I articulated to Sarah, the expedition leader, that um, you know once I got the drone up and kind of away from everybody, that it wouldn't be that loud. But then because of the surfaces, ice, rock, water, uh, the, the sound carried much more than I anticipated. So we continue to that to figure out like what is the best possible way to allow me to do my project, but also not to interfere with other people's projects. And I just um, to talk just specifically about the Arctic Circle residency and that program. If people aren't familiar with that, I know there's a website people can look at. But um, the Arctic Circle um, expeditionary residency has been around since 2009, and uh, it's really has a mission of bringing various people from different disciplines together. So not just artists, but scientists, uh, uh, poets, writers, musicians. Um, and I'm assuming the mission with um, the, the goal of uh, raising awareness about climate change and raising awareness about very particular concerns and issues in this part of the world. And, and I'm imagining that uh, the idea is that after this expedition, not only with your own work and through exhibitions like this that that really you've uh, there's a goal of of sharing that information and being an advocate uh, for environmentalism absolutely okay just to be clear yes. because it's earth day very soon yeah. <laughs> and we wanted to to, uh, to talk about um how we connect how we bring people together art and science together in this um on this ship which is a very uh, unique um, opportunity um but yeah please go ahead and uh, introduce the the guests um, yeah, I'll say real quick that in the show, I, I think everyone is, is thinking about that, that relationship and, and how the earth might be changing, um, but there, it's not extremely overt. And I, I, I think it's one really beautiful thing about the show when you're standing in there, those things kind of wash over you. And, and I hope that it forces people to think about that more, about climate change and so on. So maybe we could we could go around and um, you can reintroduce yourself, um, do a better job than I did. <laughs> maybe a little bit um, just your medium and where you're from or how you're practicing as an artist. And then um, we can go back around and just kind of talk about that ship experience. Great. Thanks, Adam. Um, I'm uh, Kate Collier, and I'm a printmaker that resides uh, right now in the Hudson Valley of New York. Um, and I think kind of in talking about the environmentalism kind of thread that we all shared, it really made uh, us as a group able to function best on land. Um, and for me, what I tried to do in terms of preparing for this trip was not to come in with any preconceived notions of what I was going to see or experience. And I also really didn't even plan what I was going to make, if anything, because I didn't want to pigeonhole myself into a project that I thought was really going to fit with what I wanted to say, because I didn't know what I wanted to say ultimately after coming back from this trip. And so going and experiencing these Arctic landscapes completely free of any kind of deadlines or, or projects really allowed me to develop my work, not only for this show, but what I'm working on moving forward. And for me, it's a lot about my work right now and kind of response from this trip is uh, expectations versus reality and then that change in reality over time due to climate change. And I think the prints in this show uh, specifically showed um, that kind of grim reality that that's changing, but also that these places are just absolutely beautiful and to be able to share that experience to some extent while we couldn't recreate the awe-inspiring grandeur of some of these areas, that that little bit that we can share with people ultimately could make them advocates as well. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Julie Forg. I, I come from Canada, New Brunswick. Um, what I really liked about this experience was the respect of silence. I think that we were 27, but it was so quiet. So even if you had a, a drone, Adam, I found that uh, the quietness of the space was so strong and everybody sort of understood that and respected that once we were online and creating. And um, for the piece in the gallery, I had also, like Kate, no really idea of what I wanted to do. 
Uh, I had an idea of working how we built places, so take a space and put value to it and then build a space. And the first time that Sarah, our guide, had talked and she said, we're going to build, once we go on land, we're going to build a triangle, a per perimeter, and we you, you can't go out of it. So right there, I understood that the guides were forming our place. So we would all be working in this triangle and building collecting data because nobody really got an art piece that was done. And that's what I really liked also about this residency was that the fact that this place that we were built by female guards with their guns, we were all in there collecting data, art data, that after the place keeps on living by our art. And just to interrupt you, um, you talking about your, your guides carrying guns. Can you let our audience know exactly why they did that? <laughs> Is it like the Wild West? <laughs> they were carrying guns uh, just in case polar bears would come around. Uh, and it wasn't to shoot them. It was to scare them away. Mm -hmm. So that's why they, they all had guns. And they would, uh, they would have their backs to us looking at the space itself. So inside was the place and outside was the space. Face, and they would be just looking around to see if danger was lurking oh. around. And were you ever in danger from a polar bear? No. no. <laughs> we saw one very, very thin one. Oh, dear. So that, I think, all... Like, that's another thing. We saw a polar bear, but everyone was so silent because we we knew he was in danger. He was yeah. so thin. So Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I am George Philip Labordain, or GP, and... I'm actually the, uh, the interloper here. It's really quite a thing to call myself an artist among people who are so committed to their craft and so good at what they do because I'm really more of an art historian who, uh, who takes photographs. What brought me to the residency was an interest in the landscape and a series of historical photographs that were taken of Greenland. Um, an American marine painter named William Bradford is the subject of my dissertation in art history at Stanford University. And... He put together a really miraculous book in 1873 that, as he called it in the introduction, was uh, to document an expedition solely for the purposes of art, if you can imagine such a thing back in the mid-19th century. This is an artist who, as the Civil War is sort of ravaging the nation, continues to go back to the Arctic because he's obsessed with the with the landscape and with the people who are there and with the with the ice, the sense of solitude, all the things that we experienced while we were up on the ship. And actually the ship that we were on, the Santigua, which is a barkentine ship, so there are square rig sails along with um, some not square rig sails, and it's more or less the same profile of boat that this historical artist was on. Um, over a century ago. So for me, it was a real sense of stepping back in time and to imagine what it would have been like to take photographs back in uh, 1869 when this historical voyage was through the Arctic. And the camera that I was using that I used to make not only some large format landscape photographs with color film, but uh, also with um, all of these artists as my sitters to make a series of portraits. That was one of the pieces I contributed to the show. The camera that I used was the same large format style view camera that uh, this artist used back in the 19th century. So that was sort of my process of my own personal challenge of entering the space and trying to recreate uh, a sense of, um, of awe and connection with the landscape with um, a technology that remains largely unchanged since this, this long time ago. GP, you also contributed a really great um, overview and essay for the show and I just want to also mention like when when I was working with the show title and and the idea of the show I was able to you know have a, a couple of email conversations with you and, and you kind of helped with that like shifting the title a little, around a little bit to to beyond nature and and there's a literary reference there to an, another book I forget the author but um, but do you want to do you want to talk a little bit about kind of the categories? Like, sure. We we were trying to think about how do we organize the show th thematically and, and and think about how people interacted with the landscape. Mm -hmm. It was a great exchange. I, you know, I think a lot of us, as we were talking about the inclination to address issues of climate change, that's led to the creation of the residency from the beginning, but also that's led each one of us personally to this space. 
um, there has been throughout American and largely through Western culture a separation between what we think of as culture and what we think of as nature. So there's the city and the country. This is a sort of back and forth that's happened since uh, the beginning of the United States. And uh, there are some philosophers and um, anthropologists who think that this is a sort of distancing that we continue to do that sort of gets us off the hook for our responsibility to the natural world. So the title, as we were thinking of a name that would be both descriptive and maybe thought-provoking, is uh, an attempt to get people to think of beyond a concept of nature being over there or beyond a, an idea of the Arctic being somewhere very far away at the edge of the world where it doesn't quite reflect the reality of our daily lives here. And of course, as contemporary climate science teaches us, everything that we do not only is, is already a part of nature here in the cities that we live, um, but it's also, it also has an effect on the th places quite far away that we couldn't hope to lay eyes on personally. So that was part of the, uh, the idea of, of using this kind of provocation in the title. The three categories that Adam put together are explorers, poets, and storytellers. And uh, I think we've already heard Julie talk about some of the, um, some of the imagery that she used in, in her work as addressing historical conceptions of explorers as used in romantic landscape paintings by Caspar David Friedrich, one of the great romantic painters um, from the 19th century in Germany. And uh, these themes help us to, to reach back into time and to look at the, the sort of narratives, the myths, if you will, that, that we've built up about human exploration of nature and to try to break those down or to reconceptualize them in a way that responds both to the historical situations that created them, but also to reframe them for a contemporary audience. Hi, my name is Annie Iwaskio, and I'm a painter based in Brooklyn, New York. I, um, I went on this trip because the setting for all of my kind of abstracted supernatural landscapes that I've been making over the course of several years, um, the setting takes place in this mythical idea of the Arctic which um, has a long history of being a mythical place and is documented well when you start to look at literature from hundreds of years ago or even thousands of years ago, beginning with um, Greek explorers. So there's a name for it and its pronunciation is a little bit hard to um, decide upon, but it's generally known as um, Thule or as we like to say as Americans, tool, T-H-U-L-E. And so having the opportunity to go on an actual um, three-masted schooner sailing around some of these actually mythical lands that were once considered completely at the edge of the world and at the edge of reality and almost straddling um, between one world and the other in terms of um, maybe life and death, perhaps, or other similar dichotomies. Um, also, Svalbard is, has been referenced like in Viking sagas. Um, it actually got its name from the Vikings, Svalbard meaning cold coast, um, essentially. So having the opportunity to go there was kind of essential to the nature of the paintings that I've been making and continue to make and explore. Um, I do want to point out that we weren't really kind of doing this tourist cruise ship situation through the Arctic, although that is a commercial enterprise that continues to grow and I think it's going to explode pretty soon, especially with the Northwest Passage opening up um, as the ice melts. So. While that wasn't the case that we were on a cruise ship, it did feel a little bit like a paradox to be visiting this remote, totally wild and protected land. All of the land we were sailing around was, I believe, a national park. And it did feel, I, I did feel a little bit of a sense of guilt for even being there. And we tried to be as responsible as possible. We used biodegradable soaps when we had to clean, or um, we used sails 
and the wind whenever possible. And I think the most magical moment, although there were many, was when we actually sailed to the edge of the ice cap on the North Pole. And the way we got there was just by using wind. And we just had this silent, fast sail all night long um, and reached the edge of the ice. So that was a moment, I think, that has been experienced so many times um, in the old ages of exploration. But now, maybe not so much. And that was really, really valuable. It's interesting from, from what you're saying there um, and from what GP was saying. I'm, I'm curious about how all of you dealt with a sense of time as well as the sense of place because it could mm -hmm. be very easy. In your description there, you're describing something that could have happened 100 years ago. So you're yeah. having these experiences. Or that, thousands of years yeah, ago. Yeah, that you're kind of compressing back in time or time sort of collapses that you're – Absolutely. 21st century, but you're in a 19th century world. Uh, for instance, with GP, I wondered, in terms of the other precautions um, and safety elements, obviously, to visit this part of the world, um, d at times, were you thinking about what your earlier expedition expeditionary teams <laughs> would have dealt with in terms of clothing and food and, and, and those kinds of things, safety? Well, I'm, I think we are all thinking about that, but we are also very aware that during the like heroic age of polar exploration they were Europe was experiencing a little ice age um, so it was a lot colder and there was a lot more sea ice to contend with than what we had mm -hmm. and the, the guides the guides did talk about um, you know sea ice in the past or historic sea ice like certain fjords would have been completely blocked to us um, that we had access to so uh, on one side, the, due to climate change, we had more access to sites and, and to land and to these places. Um, but on the flip side, it's uh, in some ways like, you know, we obviously thought about the sadness of that of the, and what do those changes mean. Mm -hmm. um, Let me also add that there is a, a young pair of artists, Ali and Claudia, who Greg, do you want to tell me their, do you remember their last names? Claudia. Um, Claudia Osteen and mm -hmm. uh, Ali Ogazian. Ogazian, right. So Claudia Steen, Osteen? Osteen. Claudia Osteen and Ali Oga... Oh my God. <laughs> Claudia... Like Gagosian without the... Like Gagosian, right, exactly. Um, <laughs> Claudia Osteen and Ali Gagosian. <laughs> Um, we'll leave that in. We won't edit that. Oh, great. <laughs> great. Anyway, these two wonderful artists were a team, and they were on the ship because they were completely fascinated with this heroic age of exploration that Annie was just talking about. So as regards your question about recreating a sort of historical sense of time, they were actually using a sextant to try to navigate, um, or at least to triangulate their position and were continuously interested in these old technologies that would have really resonated um, with a, the way that people experienced this Arctic space. We created a camera obscura, for example, in their room through the porthole of the ship. And um, I think there, was, there were contributions to the, to the residency that really drew out those um, those historical elements, what we would have been eating, what we, what our days would have been like, uh, the different kinds of challenges. So there was, there was this positive uh, influence, I think, to help us place ourselves in time as we're suiting up in smart wool and Gore-Tex every day. <laughs> so, the, But the past was still very much in the present in yes. your kind of everyday m movements around the ship and on land. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and just speaking about camera obscura and using certain camera and photographic technology we should introduce greg oh hi yeah my name's greg Locke, and i live in the northwest corner of connecticut just not far from kate in the hudson valley um and i'm a traditionally i'm a sculptor but i use a lot of digital technology in my artwork and facing this expedition which i was thrilled to be a part of i didn't really quite know what to do so i just had a very big tool set and i took weird cameras and um, I, I went with tons of data storage capability and then just decided to just try and capture as much as possible. I think I was striving um, 
for the experience. I was really, I'd experienced icebergs before, and I tried to tell people about icebergs, about how amazing they were and how large they were and how physically um, small you felt against them. And I'd taken amazing photographs of icebergs in the past, but none of them actually translated what it was like to be in that location, in that proximity. So I knew that I wasn't going to be able to do this. I, I knew I could take thousands of photographs, which I did, and, and still not be able to translate the experience. So I went to that Svalbard. I went there to archive space and the physicality around me. So I just did that through multiple, multiple photographs that I knew I could digitally reassemble these spaces later. And the way I was archiving place and... Um, as we were there, I think I'm a little frustrated with myself because um, I spent a lot of time behind the camera taking photographs of this place, trying to capture the memory of being there because it was an incredible experience. But when I get home, I look at the pictures and I can remember what it was like to be there, but I don't trust my memory. And other people look at the photos and they don't get what it was like to be there. So I'm really stuck in this place. It's almost like it didn't happen. So all my post work is is post production work is me striving to remember what it was like to be there. And I think that's an interesting connection to Julie's work. There's this question around phenomenology and right. and what it's like being in that particular place at a particular time and how to really capture that. I mean yeah. and, and how useful or not is the camera. Yeah. And I was a little envious of a, a colleague on the boat called Ron Wilde. He was my roommate. And um, he stood still on land every day for hours at a time. I think one day, didn't the water come over his boots? <laughs> and he learned how to meditate. And he was just there absorbing the experience 100%, without any uh, sort of recognition, recognition of the need to capture it. And part of me is a little envious of that because <laughs> I've come away with like amazing photographs and I've got these three-dimensional computer models I generated of this exact topography that I can recreate and simulate and re-experience. But that re-experience is always lacking something. Even in virtual reality, I have some of the glacial faces recreated in VR, you know, and you can strap on your headset and and experience those spaces kind of, but it's just a visual representation and not really a, it's not really the the real thing. Right, and what reminds you of the, the smell or the real feel of the, the cold on your skin or things like that? I just want to interject here and say that spending time with these, this small selection of artists who are on the boat in Texas in, you know, 80 degree weather, <laughs> It's very strange because I have moments of hanging out with these people in Texas where I I smell the wind in Svalbard mm -hmm. or I hear the silence. Just for a split second, it returns and then it goes away. Mm -hmm. But I, I also wanted to mention just quickly about the 24-hour daylight mm -hmm. and the cycle of the sun constantly rotating in a very small circle above our heads um, that contributed to a sense of other another place and another time that made it feel like it didn't happen when we returned. Yeah, that was a, a question I was going to have for all of you, is, is how difficult was re-entry? <laughs> um, I'm thinking, Adam, you came back to Texas in the height of the summer. Um, that must have been just <laughs> the, the climate question was something to deal with. But um, what I guess what I'm interested in is in the weeks and months following um, your return home, uh, what are some of the things that have started to either haunt you or, <laughs> or uh, that? You, and I think Greg, you're pointing to this a little bit too. There's a, there's a uh, a sense of how your memory works of this particular trip versus looking at your sketchbooks or looking at photographs. What are some of the things that you didn't expect um, upon re-entry that have occurred to you, Neil? I think there's there's going to be a lot of different answers to this question, and before we address that I wanted to, to mention something that, that Greg brought up about his experience or feeling like he didn't capture the right things and I think 
that was a really amazing experience to be on this expedition with so many different artists and of different types. And I think as with Ron's experience, we were all aware of how he was experiencing our experience. And I think that's the amazing thing about curating the show and about being on this residency that's different than any other residency I've done is that I have a little bit of um, Greg's experience. I have access to those images that he's willing to share. And I think we could kind of triangulate throughout the show and with our friendships and with the work. And for me, it, it was if I had gone on that trip alone, um, I think I would have been disappointed. And I think it's a real value of, of maintaining the, these connections after the trip and sharing those experiences because we all do have access to each other's project. Um, <clears throat> going back to the question of reentry, um, when I got to Oslo, I just stayed in my hotel room. Like I just couldn't, I just didn't have the energy to, you know, I checked my email once we got back to the port and kind of reconnected with my family and some friends. But at that point, you know, right before I took a final flight home, I just was like wiped out. And I think for me, even being in this luxurious environment, a nice bed and everything, I just kept thinking about going back to all those other expeditions that had happened and maybe tapping into that exhaustion a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had this, and I guess I still do, this intense longing to be back. And for me, it's kind of this dull ache. And coming back also to a summer not as intense as <laughs> Texas, um, I just really even couldn't think about it. It didn't register in my brain being in the summer to, to do work or to decompress what I've collected. I had to wait until winter. And being in New York, I actually was able to experience a little bit of winter and of cold. And I felt more at home creating work and going through reference photos and developing projects then that I didn't think I could do during the summer. I wasn't as connected with the Arctic in a humidity and 80 degrees in shorts than when I was in a puffy vest in <laughs> the middle of my living room watching snowfall. And I even then wasn't totally connected with the Arctic, and I don't think I really can be. And that's kind of sad in this, the same way, but also knowing that the experiences we've had, um, even it, for the continued trips that this Arctic Circle residency takes, will never be the same. The The landscapes we viewed and the experiences we had changed days after we've left, and that landscape is not only dwindling, but ever-changing. And that, I think, also adds to this mm -hmm. longing that I have to to recreate, but then also re-experience mm -hmm. that space. Yeah, I went directly to Tokyo after <laughs> Svalbard. <laughs> and uh, I go back to Japan every year, but this time I just stayed in my room for like two days. And I felt bad because I was in this country and this city that I love, but I just couldn't go outside. It was like super warm and humid and people everywhere. I just couldn't handle it. Mm. Um, and for the ship, I remember, Greg, I had told you, oh, I had just brought 15 films with me. And you said, oh, my God, I'm worried about you. But these films, for me, I'm more attached to these images than anything I took uh, digitally. Because I really, really, I knew I had only this amount of images. And I had really to look and live the place to be able to take an image compared to the digital format. So for me, those images, I'm more closely linked to those experiences than anything I took uh, mm. digitally. But yeah, and it's in all in black and white, so it creates that uh, magical space mm -hmm. also. Yeah. Did you have 15 rolls of them? Rolls, only 15 medium format, so that's only like 10 image per mm -hmm. roll. I'm just to follow up on this, like what it was, what was it like afterwards? I I called in on the UK on the way home because I'm English, and um, I remember driving. I rented a car, and it was daylight, and then I was driving, and I was going quite far. I like to drive fast, but I remember. Look, I really distinctly remember looking over my right shoulder, and the sun was setting, and it freaked me right out. I had to stop because 
I, we hadn't seen that for three weeks. Mm-hmm. Like, the sun just did no, got nowhere near setting. They did a circle in the sky. And then suddenly the sky was a little bit orange. And it wasn't a dramatic sunset by any means, but the sun was going down. And I, it stopped me in my tracks and it made me... Well, I don't know what it made me do, but I can conjure that image up very, very clearly now. It's a very, mm-hmm. you know, memorable moment mm-hmm. post-trip. I had the exact same experience, but it was at JFK uh, looking out of the airplane window because we landed at dusk and the sun was a red ball um, about to fall beneath the horizon line. And I couldn't stop looking at it. And it was, I was texting people about it. Like, the sun is setting. <laughs> but it, it felt kind of apocalyptic almost. It, it didn't feel apocalyptic. I just, it felt like something I'd never seen before. Mm-hmm. Or you were um, seeing it new for the first time. Or yeah. For the first time. And then that weekend I was up in um, a very rural countryside area. And I was outside looking over a mountainous landscape. And I saw the sunset. And then I watched the stars emerge, and it completely blew my mind. I, wa- I left the party I was at and just walked away <laughs> and stood looking at the stars for who knows how long, and it was transfixing. So I'm going to add another uh, re-entry story that is going to seem a little crass by comparison to <laughs> the experience of beautiful sunsets. But um, just to contextualize the experience on the ship in which – you know, we're sitting around a table right now that feels about the size of the room that I occupied with another human being for, <laughs> for two weeks. Um, <clears throat> your horizon of possibility is both uh, almost infinite because you're looking out on this landscape that seems never ending, but then also extremely narrowed, which is to say you wake up every morning and there's essentially one thing to do, which is to be present in the landscape. Um, we had breakfast at the same time every day. We had lunch at the same time every day, had dinner at the same time every day. Most of us had drinks at the same time every evening. The sun is still tracing its circle in the sky. But the the only thing on your plate is just to go out and sort of do what it was you were there to do. And th- this crass thing I was alluding to was just the simple fact of not having access to your phone for two straight weeks it's, I can't remember the last time I have not been connected to the internet or to a text message for two weeks. And so the sense of distraction or of other possibility that comes through those kinds of interactions that we have without thinking about it every day, it's just stripped away. So um, it's like that, that secondary layer of interaction or of knowledge or of accessibility has just been uh, cut off for this amount of time that we were there. And that was a, that was a powerful sensation that I only realized upon reentry, sort of in retrospect, when I reconnected. Um, to your question, too, about the smells, and this is just sort of a, maybe a way of accessing time through, you know, I think we, we very often think of time as visual change, but there was a moment of, um, of the trip in which the, it was actually the smell that made me think of how old the landscape was. And it's when we were out on some Zodiacs. In, in order to get to our landing sites, we would every day suit up in these life preservers over all of our gear and descend from this steel hold ship into small inflatable Zodiacs. And then we get ferried to land. Very often we would be taken through sort of um, very very chunky bays full of ice that was crackling and popping and bumping up against the boat. And on one occasion, we were all looking at this dramatic face of a glacier as bits of it broke off and fell into the ocean. But then from behind us, we sort of felt this shuddering. I wrote about this in an article for The Point magazine um, a few months ago after returning. And so we all turned around with a collective gasp and saw this iceberg that had broken off of the glacier that was reorienting itself. It essentially was breaking apart in the bay, and so and then parts of it that had been underwater were sort of cranking up into sight. And what I'll always remember is, you know, it was mesmerizing to see this thing sort of rotating and clicking through the ocean. It was the size of like a, a stout Victorian house from my home <laughs> in San Francisco. So not a huge iceberg, but still big by comparison to us. And what I remember is actually this 
almost repellent freshness of air mm. that was sort of gasping out of this ice. Um, climatologists, when they're doing uh, work about historical climate, actually use ice cores because they've preserved oxygen mm -hmm. from hundreds, if not thousands, of years ago. And that's what I was thinking of as this this gush of fresh air, like as if we had opened an Egyptian tomb and uh, all of this oxygen sort of rushes out or in and there's, there's a displacement that happens. That was, um, that was one of the most powerful uh, sensory phenomenological moments of the trip for me that had nothing to do with vision. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Took my breath away just <laughs> thinking about that. Um, and the, the kind of the breath or the air of icebergs, wow. Yeah. Um, we should probably start to bring our conversation to a close. Um, and uh, just one thing before I ask you all a question, we mentioned Ron's work um, uh, and his contemplative um, uh, kind of practice. Um, and I just wanted to say that his piece um, in the exhibition is, is, sort of, is serious and humorous at the same time. It's a a wooden cutout um, of his figure, based on his figure, a silhouette of his figure. And um, as part of the exhibition, we've been moving it around the gallery in homage to him. So I uh, just wanted to include that so you had an indication of what his uh, contribution to the exhibition was. Um, and just for the final um, few moments, um, perhaps each of you could just tell us a little bit about... Um, the body of work or what you're working on, projects you're working on at the moment, uh, whether they're connected or not to this, that's fine. Um, but just tell us a little bit about what you're working on right now. I'm um, sifting through my files still, but um, it was quite nice to have this excuse to produce something that was kind of gallery ready. Um, so it put me in a, a good place regarding my studio practice. And for me, that's spending a lot of time on the computer creating, recreating all these um, the, all these uh, structures, these ice structures, and playing around with, uh, with them in my virtual sculpture studio and creating uh, objects. Uh, I'm, I'm, I went around collecting all the buildings on this trip that I've came across, like little sheds and shacks and houses, and I've been recreating them digitally and turning them into objects, and currently I'm floating them on strings like they're dirigibles, um, and playing around with video. So I think this really kick-started a, a period of investigation, um, and it gave me tons of material. What I haven't done since the trip is take a photograph with seriousness like you're done with that I'm for kind of, I don't need any more material for a while <laughs> you're broken I think a lot of us are probably in that place yeah so I'm continuing my investigations into um, all eras of arctic exploration and I've made several paintings referencing um, very old moments of kind of transcendent discoveries in the arctic and specifically delving into um moments of discovery with icebergs where people didn't know what icebergs were or didn't have the word for them in their language. So anyway, I'm just continuing to make my, try to make my paintings as otherworldly and um, kind of supernatural as possible. Um, really trying to push my understanding of and representation of liminal spaces. So I think the paintings are getting more and more abstract rather than taking direct imagery from my trip. Um, I have almost no imagery from the trip itself, very few photographs that I would use in my studio. It's more about um, having a memory of the place. Well, I have a dissertation to finish. This trip was uh, in part, uh, part of the research and inspiration for uh, this historical material that I'm writing about. So that's the big thing on my plate. I, like everyone else, have a tremendous backlog, I think, of images that I still want to process. I've, I've processed all my film, but I still need to um, develop quite a bit of it, choose which, which photographs I feel like I want to, to take the time to edit and print. 
Um, but for now, it's really just the writing. So uh, letting letting this experience, letting the the images feed into those memories, and to to try to to try to evoke the experience of being there as much as possible when I talk about these historical images. And GP, you're a curator as well. Mm -hmm. um, you imagine at some point in the future there'd probably be an exhibition that you would work on that might Absolutely. come you know, from the historic aspect of what you're um, researching. Yes, you know, there, one of the paintings by the artist I'm writing, I'm writing about is in the de Young Museum, one of the fine arts museums of San Francisco. It's just come back from a... Um, a, a really wonderful exhibition organized by the Terra Foundation for American Art that imagines um, American broadly conceived landscape. And so it was actually in three different countries, exhibitions in Brazil, in the United States, and in Canada um, that tried to unite all of this material as America, but in, in sort of a ver vertical, um, longitudinal way. So. Um, uh, that's that's a way that I might might explore things to try to think um, in the spirit of this exhibition, try to connect things more than just from um, a particular radial perspective, but to try to bring artists who are addressing similar issues together, um, even though they might not be exclusively Arctic in nature. Thank you. Julie? Um, I'm working on printing the images of the Arctic. Um, I'm also going in August at the Swatch Art Peace Hotel residency. I'll be there for six months in Shanghai. So I plan to bring those prints to Shanghai and see how the work in Shanghai could maybe emerge something new. Uh, yeah, that's, that's about it. Yeah. For me, uh, the work that I've made from the trip to now have been uh, prints on paper. So my work presently is uh, to redefine what a print is, not only in dimensional space, but also in material. And so I'm working currently on an installation of three-dimensional carved woodcuts that ultimately end up um, being cast as multiples in glass. And I think that that's me trying to recreate the feeling in terms of an immersive environment of um, multiples of these ice s chunks in glass creating this installation ice field. Mm -hmm. And so that I'm, I'm really excited to kind of develop and then create iterations of that in different spaces for more viewers mm -hmm. to kind of feel what, at least an attempt to feel what we experienced in the Arctic. Thank you. <clears throat> Adam? Um, as a painter who is trying to work with f making this film. And I think one project I'll have is to figure out how to best present it. I think that's a whole project in itself. And there's a lot of moving pieces outside the project to take care of. Um, so that'll be one of my learning experiences over the next year. Uh, and then I've started working on new paintings um, for a show in the fall. And I'll maybe attempt to work with those paintings in the context of the film and have them shown together. Uh, and then another project that I'll be assisting with is, is moving the show to other locations, hopefully, including perhaps Canada with Julie and maybe even to um, Greg's school, Hotchkiss, and farther afield to Australia. Yeah. Well, good luck to all of you. Um, we're glad that, that you're here um, with us in Texas and we're able to see your work and share it with our students and the good people of Fort Worth. Um, we hope you'll have another occasion to come back and visit us, but good luck with your projects. We hope that you'll stay in touch and be a friend to the art galleries at TCU. We'll, we'll bug Adam to make sure that you do. Um, thank you for your time uh, and your energy uh, towards the exhibition and for this project and especially for being here this morning. I know you've been very busy uh, and on the go since that you've arrived here. So we're really glad that you could take time this morning to talk to us. And I know our audience is uh, really going to uh, enjoy um, this piece. Uh, certainly I found it fascinating, just some of the anecdote anecdotes and also taking notes about um, some of your projects and the historical aspects that I'm going to follow up on myself. Uh, so it's really fascinating to hear um, six very different stories and experiences from the Arctic Circle. Uh, thank you all for being here today, and thank you, Adam. Thank you again for curating such a beautiful exhibition. Uh, and again, this is Sarah Jane Parsons from the Art Galleries at TCU saying goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>